Sandy Robertson was one of the music industry's most significant unsung behind-the-scenes heroes. During a career that spanned more than 60 years, he changed the lives of many artists, engineers, mixers, producers, and music lovers in general. Without him, the music world today would look very different. As a producer, artist manager, and record company owner, Robertson played a central part in the birth of the British folk movement. As a publisher, he helped shape some of the most seminal albums ever made. And more than 40 years ago, he was the first person to set up a major producer management company. With World's End Management, Robertson changed the way the contracts and careers of engineers, mixers, and producers are shaped. For example, Robertson was the first to negotiate points. He masterminded long-term careers for a large number of top studio professionals, including Tim Palmer, Don Woz, Dave Sardi, Nick Launay, Larry Klein, Stephen Haig, Stephen Lipson, and many, many more. Sandy Robertson passed away on July the 25th this year at the age of 80. Everybody who knew him, myself included, saw him as an extraordinary person. Stephen Lipson commented in a Billboard magazine article that Robertson was the best sounding board the voice of reason, and above all, the most honorable and loyal man I've ever had the honor of working with. Never greedy, always fair. His funeral should be at the Royal Albert Hall. It would be standing room only. And producer and bass player Larry Klein recalled a larger-than-life person who made a huge difference. There are certain people in the world whose presence is so deep and expansive and reaches so many people around them that they have this this kind of ability to move things forward in the world with, with incredible speed and and alacrity and energy and he was one of those people there's very few people who I can think of who had this ability but he did Alexander William Robertson was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1942 and moved to Kenya with his parents when he was just six years old. His long road to change the world of music began in Africa, where he joined a local beat group called Les Ombres. Robertson returned to London in 1963, intent on a career in music. He formed a duo called Rick and Sandy. They found a manager. Tom Springfield, the brother of Dusty Springfield, who got them signed to Fontana, for which they recorded several singles. The duo then moved to Decca and enjoyed some success with the single I Lost My Girl, which was produced by Les Reed. Robertson also released two singles as a solo artist, first a cover of Neil Diamond's Solitary Man on Columbia under the name Sandy, next a cover of a Bob Dylan song Baby, You've Been On My Mind, on Polydor, under the name Lucian Alexander. Baby, you've been on my mind. Despite TV and radio appearances, Rick and Sandy and Robertson's solo singles failed to get much traction, and he decided to get involved in the business side of the music industry. He went to work for Arc Music, which was Chess Records of London operation, as well as Regent Music, Jewel music and Lowry music. The writers he was dealing with included legends like John Lee Hooker, Willie Dixon, Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters, and many others. Robertson's job consisted mostly of convincing UK artists to record songs from the catalogues of these companies. George Dufame's cover of Billy Stewart's Sitting in the Park was one of Robertson's main achievements, as were several covers on John Mayall's seminal Blues Breakers album with Eric Clapton a.k.a. the Beano album. The latter resulted in a lifelong connection between Robertson and producer Mike Vernon. Vernon set up Blue Horizon Records, where Robertson also worked. Towards the end of the 60s, Sandy started producing, working with acts like the Chocolate Watch Band, Liverpool Scene, and the Ian Anderson Country Blues Band. Robertson had a keen interest in the burgeoning folk rock scene in the UK. He discovered Steel Eye Span, which featured folk stalwarts like Ashley Hutchins, Tim Hart, Maddie Pryor, and later Martin Carthy. Robertson produced the first three Steel Eye Span records, Hark the Village Wait, Pleased to See the King, and Ten Man Mop, or Mr. Reservoir Butler Rides Again. 
By the early 70s, Robertson had become one of the leading producers of the British folk rock scene. He co-produced the famous debut album of the Albion Country Band and Shirley Collins, No Roses, and produced the highly rated debut album by the band Plain Song, In Search of Amelia Earhart. Plain Song was founded by Ian Matthews, who had been in Fairport Convention, and Andy Roberts, who came from the Liverpool scene. Robertson formed long-standing working relations with Matthews and Roberts, and he produced many solo albums by both artists. These include six solo albums by Roberts, starting with Homegrown and several of Matthews' solo albums, starting with Journey from the Gospel Oak. Robertson also produced albums by Decameron, Shirley Collins, Cloggs, Mark Ellington, John Martin, and many more. John Martin's album, Well Kept Secret, marked Robertson's final and 55th production effort. By the mid-70s, he had moved into artist management, looking after Decameron, Gay and Terry Woods, and John Martin. Together with Matthews, he set up Rockborough Records, where they released records by artists under their management. These artists included Alan Taylor, The Woods Band, Wilco Johnson, and many others. By 1980, the British folk rock movement had passed its peak and was declining in popularity. The music industry was beginning to shift its rhythm from acts releasing an album once a year to every few years. Talking about his work as a producer, Robertson remarked in an interview around this time, I was getting a lot of work offered that involved artists that I had never heard of. I get three quarters of my way through the record into which I was putting a lot of love and then suddenly I realized that after the record company had sent out the promotional discs, nothing else was going to be heard of the record again. In the end, things just didn't seem worth it. And though I was getting well paid, I just got more and more depressed and felt that I was becoming the backroom boy's backroom boy. These factors also forced Robertson to look for other opportunities. In an interview in 2004, he recalled, I was working with artists I signed to my production company because I believed in them and was trying to get them a deal. At the end, there were a couple of records that I didn't manage to place. And when you are stuck with all of the studio bills, it makes you think. The last record I produced was a John Martin record well-kept secret. Phil Thonnelly was the engineer, and I asked him what he was doing next, and he said he didn't know. This is a guy who had worked with the Thompson twins and Duran Duran, so I said, let me find you a project. So I got him a job, and I thought, there's a business here. The result was that Robertson set up World's End Producer Management in 1980, together with Paul Brown. The name was in reference to the World's End District of Chelsea, London, where the company was based and the aim was to improve these contracts, working conditions, and careers of engineers and producers. World's End called itself probably the first full-service company to ever solely represent producers, mixers, and engineers, and one of its early clients was Tim Palmer. His um, production management was the first sort of person really, he was the first person to really um, create the whole idea of being a producer, full-service management. And, you know, having an office and just representing producers and mixers in the way he did had never been done before. And, you know, some of the things through the years that he did, which I thought were quite special, was he he would create a newsletter and he would send it out to every A&R man every month. And on in the newsletter, you could flick through and all the producers and mixers, all the projects they've been working on came to the attention then of the A&R staff. I don't think anyone had done that at that time. I think he was pretty instrumental in changing the way that the business deals were done. I know for a fact that in my case, um, I never got royalties on mixes. And as, as my career went further forward, Sandy started to negotiate and said, look, I've, I've managed to get you a one point um, royalty and uh, that was you know li- very life-changing for me because certain projects that I mixed did very well and it wasn't for Sandy I wouldn't have ever got that. In 1985 Robertson moved World's End to Los Angeles and became sole owner of the company. World's End quickly became the leading producer management company in the world managing at one point a roster of 75 engineers mixers and producers with a supporting staff of half a dozen or more. One of his staff members was Dana Child, who remembers. Whenever I came to work in the morning, uh, he would already be in there, already been on like however many calls with England before we even got in there. He'd be usually having either making in the kitchen a big, huge cup of chamomile tea, or he'd be in his office already with the, with the tea, sipping it. And um he was just like nonstop. Like, I think 
you know, the chamomile tea served to kind of like calm him down because he was always like very, you know, he's like the energizer buddy, like making deals, calling this person, calling that person, you know. Um, I think somebody had mentioned like when they were on the phone with them, it was never like, okay, well, we'll see, you know, he wasn't one for long goodbyes. You'd be saying goodbye to him and he'd like hang up the phone and be on to the next call already before you even had a chance to put the phone down. The producers who Robertson represented all have memories of him as an amazing person who worked tirelessly on their behalf, not only as a manager, but also as a mentor and father figure. He was available whenever I called or emailed, he would get back instantly. It was extraordinary. And I don't think it felt like work for him. I think it felt like him. That, that's the feeling I always got. He was special. And I think that's why he, he did so well and, and uh, people really revered him, I would say, as a human being as well as a manager. He was just a good, good guy. And, and I always knew that if he was representing me, I was safe. You know, people would like him. He'd get a good enough deal. I don't know if he was the best deal maker. It doesn't really, you know, big picture stuff. It doesn't really matter. But uh, everyone enjoyed dealing with him. Never a bad word about him. And that felt, I, I felt proud to be represented by him. And I quickly learned that, you know, running things past Sandy was never a bad idea. He would always give me frank advice, always. Um, and oftentimes it would be, the news that I didn't necessarily want to hear. He was not, a, he was not afraid to tell you the hard truth about something. And that would be anything from, I think what you, you know, what you've just turned in as far as a mix um, is, is subpar and that could be hard to hear. Um, and he would also warn me about like personal things like, you know, are you getting enough rest? He would say that all the time. You know, are you sleeping much? How are things going? He would check in, especially on long-term projects where I might be tracking for months. Um, he would check in almost daily, um, sometimes email, but oftentimes back in the day, a phone call. And he just wanted to know that, you know, the ship was still upright, hadn't capsized, you're coming into port. Um, and if there were any issues, um, he would address them immediately. And if that meant running some interference with the record label and between the record label and myself or the band, he was willing to do it. He was one of those rare people that I think he slept like four hours a night or something like that. You know, he just had the ability to, he could have been a doctor, you know, in that way. But, 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 uh, yeah, he, he just, you know, I'd get emails from him and think, what's, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> Emailing me at, 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 at five in the morning or four or three thirty or whatever, you know? I just remember being so impressed with his energy. I mean, you know, there are certain people who just have this expansive and deep kind of presence in the world. And, and, and he was one of those people and he, you know, he just always had a, a, a bright and up kind of energy about him. And he was just always thinking about different aspects of, his clients' lives, and he really affected me like a, you know, like a second father or something, you know. He was he was incredibly thoughtful and helpful in every aspect of things. He was there for family occasions when my son was born, who's 13 now. Uh, Beautiful. We received a big basket of flowers and fantastically thoughtful guy with a, a memory not to be believed. But yeah, he had the ability to make one feel like you were his only client right. and, and that you were family. Sandy was more than just a manager. And I think all the World's End clients felt that he was more than just a business sort of manager type guy. He was a friend. Uh, this music business that we all work in can be very, very frustrating at times. It doesn't always go the way that we'd like it to go. It's not always the way Instagram would like to portray it. And there are times when you get messed around and Sandy was always 
there for me to call him up and vent and tell him how mad and upset I was. And he would listen and, and he was very fatherly in his advice. And, uh, he, uh, he never weakened in the sense of he, he would never take no for an answer. He was very passionate about getting the best deal for all his clients, sometimes to uh, the detriment of the A&R staff. <laughs> but, um, but he always found the fair way and always uh, defended very heavily his clients. And, and, and he was just a wonderful guy to, for me to be able to call up every week. And, you know, even if we weren't on a project together, just talk about his long experience in the industry and talk about all the fun times we had together um because we went through a lot in that 40 years and uh, i was very lucky to meet somebody like that that i wanted to stay with for such a long period of time the other thing about sandy and world's end uh was that, that all the staff he had at, at his office were just fantastic people and they're still friends of mine to this day just in, in incredibly hard working uh uh people mostly women and, and they were just like really, really looked after after me, and they, I know they looked after all the producers um, they they had. And in fact, you know, it, with World's End, it, it was very much like a big family. I mean, so many of my best friends were managed by Sandy, and and I often met them through him, especially coming to LA. I mean, it's um, yeah, it's it, it's very much World's End. It was very much like a, a community of of people, you know, engineers and producers. And also he would he would, you know, get certain engineers that he was managing to work with producers. And those relationships were really important as well. So, um, yeah, w World's End was great, a great, great, great thing to be part of. From a business perspective, Robertum was able to arrange excellent deals for his clients, sometimes to their great amazement. The first thing that Sandy did for me in capacity as producer, as my manager was he took a fairly casual meeting that I had had with Gary Gersh, who was then the fairly new president of Capitol Records. And he turned a verbal uh, agreement between Gary and myself to maybe uh, advance me a little bit of money to help me with my current problem in fall of 1993, which was a control room and wiring that needed to be renovated. I had just worn it out after five years of, of work. And he turned that into a five-year uh, producer deal with Capitol Records. Wow. Um, yeah, that um, that far went far beyond anything that I had even considered. And it was just something Sandy enjoyed doing it. Gary seemed to think it was a great idea. Uh, he was able to uh, see long term in a way that at that point I couldn't and maybe still can't. <laughs> uh, that was one, one of the gifts that he had. And that was um, taking all the experience as a musician and as a, a, a record producer himself and as somebody who ran publishing companies and record labels himself. Um, and he was able to sort of see where things were going and, and trends. Um, and he brought that to play for the benefit of his clients. I really think that um, Sandy is a, a unique kind of manager. I, I can't imagine another, another manager like Sandy because he had this way of being super nice, you know, to us us producers but he also was really tough with record labels and managers like i remember you know when he first started managing me and i'd go they go oh who managed you and i say sandy and they say oh my god um you know yeah he's he's like a bulldog and i was like really <laughs> he doesn't seem like a bulldog to me uh you know because he's always so sweet and uh you know, I did did definitely see that side of him. You know, obviously working with him for thirty years, you'd see the the side and the other side. And but you know, I think it, it's it's a great quality to have to be able to be very uh, sympathetic to music and artists and be very encouraging of the art, uh, but also be able to have that 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 legal sort of business mind as a manager to deal with with record companies because i mean 
it, it's, it's my opinion that most certainly most major record companies are doing absolutely everything they can to 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 rip you off and the artist off i mean it's uh, you know and y if you don't know all the tricks they get up to you know you're going to end up um you know not not being paid what you should be paid and so you do need someone who who can be really tough and and know all those little little all the little writing which i'm terrible at that kind of stuff i'm just not interested you know so for me it was really good because he was very much like um encouraging me to be arty and uh then he would do the business you know i think it was such a holistic thing with sandy i think you know he had so many bases i think you know not only was he a manager but you felt like he was a friend and and sort of somebody who um you know that you could sort of take any idea to and sort of get a bounce back from it um i think one of the things that was really really powerful to me was his ability to be so positive about things you know and i remember on projects there were a couple of times on projects where you know you get deep into a project and you're sort of you know you're struggling with something or somebody or something like that and and, and he was always really good at sort of back to its center and like this is you know, bringing back the positivity and making, you know, giving you the ability to be able to sort of recenter yourself and see things from, from a good perspective. And I think the fact that he was a producer and the fact that he was involved in so many aspects of the music business, a performer, a writer, a guitar player, all, all of those things, you know, I think those, those were invaluable in his, um, you know, in his ability to be able to communicate with you or understand the situations that you were going through. All the producers who worked with Roberton talked about his capacity to keep them inspired and focused and further their careers. Sandy was, you know, even when your career would have a natural curve to it and at, at a lower part of the curve for me, I was starting to get a bit worried and think, oh, I wonder if I'm going to manage to maintain my career. And Sandy was always super supportive and always there for me. And he called me one day and he said, look, I've got this project that I think would be great. And I said, okay, what is it? And he said, it's mixing a couple of songs on the Michael Hutchins album. And Michael had sadly recently died. So the, this album was being mixed after his death. And he said, look, it's, it's very simple. And Sandy always had a master plan and some of them I would never believe. And this was one that I definitely didn't believe, but he <laughs> said, look, it's simple. You're going to work on this album for Michael. You're going to mix these two songs. Bono happens to guest on the chorus of one of them. Bono's going to hear the album, uh, the song and love it. And he's going to call you up and you're going to go to Dublin and work on the next U2 album. And I laughed and we laughed together and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> It was so bizarre. And we literally, we worked on these two mixes and Bono was so happy with it. He did call me and um, I ended up, that's how I ended up working on the All That You Can't Leave Behind album. The person I spoke to most days, I spoke to him about um, kind of everything. He would call me, I would call him. It was an ongoing dialogue about sort of everything about work but more than work it was a sort of actually it turned into a deep friendship i would say i i suspect he was like that with all his clients because he just didn't stop he was available whenever i called or emailed he would get back instantly it was extraordinary and i don't think it felt like work for him. I think it felt like him. That That's the feeling I always got. Just the holistic thing, the fact that it was such a well-rounded thing. And, and as you'd said earlier, you know, a gentleman. I always felt like, you know, whatever the situation was, whenever you handed Sandy the reins as far as dealing with things and organizing the setup for things, you always knew that it was going to be taken care of really you know in the best possible way you were in safe hands as far as somebody taking care of that side of things you had he had your back so I, I always felt like he had my back in an interview in 2004 with richard james burgess robertson explained as producer managers we always have to come up with new ideas the days of sitting by the phone waiting for it to ring are over 
It's not like the late 70s and the early 80s when the labels were making hundreds of records. I spend my time traveling from London to New York to Los Angeles. I'm constantly out there networking with A&R people and with artist managers. If you're a record company and you've got a new act, it's hard to come up with someone off the top of your head. And if you do come up with someone, there's always the question of who represents the guy and how to get a hold of them. I think producer managers' main role is to educate and keep people informed about their clients. Robertson was a visionary throughout his life who eagerly used the latest studio technology in his producer days, who also was quick to adapt to the latest developments in the music industry. He pushed record companies to get up to speed with the download and streaming technologies that came with the internet. And he was very early on recognizing this also changed the role of producers. Robertson pushed record companies in other ways as well, as this rather amusing anecdote reveals. As I mentioned, Sandy was tough on making sure that his clients were being paid. And when I was at South by Southwest one year, I spoke to an a r guy called Derek Oliver, who used to work in very much in, in the rock field. I don't know if you knew Derek. And Derek said to me, um, yes, Andy, wow, if you don't pay him, he's on your case. And I said, oh, I know, I know. It's great for us, though. He said, well, he said, for me, he said, Sandy somehow found the telephone number through my assistant of my mother-in-law. And Sandy called me on Christmas Day. They said, there's a call for you from Sandy Robertson. He said, I came away from the Christmas lunch. And he said, you've got to pay my client. And he sent a motorbike messenger over to my mother-in-law's house on Christmas Day to collect a check. You know, he had no uh, qualms about persistently bugging someone who would not return a call or would not return a note. He would just, he, he would just go in there one time after another and bug them until relentlessly until there was an answer usually i mean sometimes you know with some people their their method of saying no to something is just to kind of ghost a person and you know but he would he, he would email someone 10 times before he would give in and nice like i'm i'm super fond of sandy and i appreciate everything i learned under him when I worked there. Uh, get the money, man. <laughs> get the money. No. Uh, no, but that's true, actually, with any kind of management. But yeah, so coming from management and then, and then you know, working with Sandy, it was just really more of sort of like a style of management that I learned from him that was like, you know, basically just, you know, be fair, but try and get the best possible deal for your client and don't leave any stone unturned, i.e. like don't let anything fall through the cracks. Already in the beginning of this century, Robertson encouraged his clients to sign acts and form their own production companies because he had spotted that, in his words in 2004, urban producers were in control of acts long before the rock producers were. The producers were signing acts, making deals, and writing songs. It's very producer-driven. In 2005, Robertson and World's End founded the Beverly Martell label, which released music acts like The Philistines Jr., Amelia Carey, Tom Forrest, The Wild State, April Ivy, Apropos, The High Divers, Rowan, Mozella, Liquid Monk, Josh Difford, Courtesy Tear, Kurt Castle, and Lions in the Street. In 2007, he set up I Am Sound with his daughter, Nikki Robertson. The company describes itself as a hub of music, art, culture, and marketing, a hybrid creative studio, record label, and visual artist management firm, a new model for a new hybrid era, and has released recordings by Florence and the Machine, Lord Huron, Nikki Lane, Charlie XCX, and many others. Robertson had no interest in retiring and kept working until the days before his passing, as Tim Palmer remembers. As he approached, sadly, the end of his life, uh, he was in hospital. And once I found out, I would call him or text him and, and say, you know, Sandy, you, uh, you need to really just take it easy and concentrate on getting your health, get strong again. And uh, he responded, would you be interested in mixing Andrea Bocelli's new album? I've been speaking to EMI and I couldn't believe it. He was actually in his hospital bed and he was still calling labels. 
And I questioned him about it. I said, how are you managing to call the labels? You know, it's hard for you to even speak at the moment. And he said, I took a glass, I got a glass of water, I drank it, and I don't think anyone even knew that I was in hospital. I mean, it's incredible, incredible. <laughs> but that's the way that Sandy would have wanted. And, you know, it's a terrible thing to say, but Sandy didn't want to retire. And he literally worked up until the day that he died. And uh, so he did succeed in that. Everyone who knew Sandy testifies to the fact that he hated saying goodbye. He'd hang up the phone very quickly, and in the end, he left the way he lived his life. He had some personality quirks, and one of those personality quirks, besides his interesting accent, was he really didn't like to say goodbye. Uh, when you were on the phone with Sandy, he'd say, speak soon, or talk to you later, in a really quick exit, he, you know, an Irish exit. <laughs> he, would, uh, he would end a conversation quickly, and I don't know that I ever heard him say goodbye. Um, not even like, bye-bye. But he'd say, you know, talk to you soon, you know, speak soon. And um, I think that Sandy didn't like to see people leave, um, uh, whether he were, there were clients of his or employees. And I, uh, that, that seemed to come up an awful lot in, in this event, at this event. And uh, uh, one of the women that worked in the office said, you know what? I remember every time I would leave, say on a Friday or at the end of a long day, I'd say, Sandy, I'm leaving. And she said, uh, he never failed to correct me and say, you're not leaving, you're going home. <laughs> I have a massive regret. Quite a few months ago, I think actually it was the end of last year, I contacted Sandy about interviewing him. I think in this brief video, it does not fully tell the tale of Sandy. Sandy, he was the producer manager's producer manager. Everybody in town knew him. They all loved him, but they also kind of feared him because he could get the deal done. He would get you paid. He, and he didn't mince words. If he liked something, he would praise it. If he didn't like something, he would tell you to do it again. He would tell you to improve it. He would make you think better. I remember when I was producing an artist I tried about four or five different ways of producing this artist. And finally, I got this sound that started to make some sense. And I took it to Sandy and I played it to him. And he goes, by Jove, I think you cracked the code. To hear Sandy say something like that was probably one of the most pleasing things for any of us that were producers that were managed by Sandy. It is a massive regret that I didn't get to interview him. It was only maybe a month or two before he died that I did the last Stephen Lipson interview that Stephen and I did, and Sandy set it all up. He was sending us emails going, Stephen's waiting. Stephen had been on the call like five minutes and we weren't there yet, you know, on the Zoom call. And he's like, Stephen's waiting, where are you? And now, now that I know more, I mean, he, was, he had cancer. He was super ill when he did that, but he did not stop working. Many people didn't even know that he was 80 years old. I think that's a strong testament to his spirit, to the fact that he was always on the ball, he was always focused, he cared about his clients and his friends and family above everything else. It was an incredible experience to work with Sandy Robertson. As you can tell, there's so many people here that were dying to talk about him, and I, I, my only grip... <laughs> My other regret is that I couldn't make this a four-hour video and get every single person that's ever met him. Everybody loved him. Sandy, we owe you so much. Thank you ever so much for being an incredible person. Such a huge part of the music industry. Oh, I've got to tell you this. So I'm a huge John Martin fan. Huge. So I knew that Sandy had managed him and also had produced him. And one day I'm on the phone talking about something completely unconnected to John Martin. And then I bring it up and we talked about the Grace and Danger album. Sandy told me about working with John and how everybody who knows John Martin's music is a huge, huge fan. And if you look at the kind of players that Sandy got, I'm going to read out some of the players to work with John. John Martin, obviously, Tommy Eyre, keyboards, John Giblin on bass, Phil Collins on drums. This is like the height of Phil Collins' powers. Alan Thompson on bass, just these incredible musicians. And then the following album, Glorious Fool, is Eric Clapton, Alan Thompson, Max Middleton on keyboards, Phil Collins again on drums. Just 
And that's one that Nick Launay actually engineered as well. Just this incredible, incredible cast of characters. And Sandy said they all played for scale. There was no huge egos. Nobody came in there demanding, I want this massive appearance fee. They played for whatever the minimal amount they could be paid. It's because it's a combination of John Martin being a huge talent and the fact that it's Sandy Robertson. Sandy Robertson, who could pull together the greatest and most famous players in the world at the time and put them in a room and just create some amazing music. Sandy, you are going to be sorely missed. I got quite teary-eyed when I found out you'd gone. First person, of course, I called was Tim Palmer, who had spent his whole career being managed by Sandy. So many people here have said to me, I don't know if I'll ever find another manager as good as Sandy, somebody who cared about everything. I'll just have to reiterate, he was the producer manager's producer manager. It doesn't get any better. We love you, Sandy. Thanks, everybody, for watching. So long, farewell, au revoir, adios, tout zines, ciao, goodbye.